you are tuned to KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or 88.1 KSCF in Fresno. The time is 10 a.m. Today, Economic Update is being preempted to bring you Project Censored Special Broadcast on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President J.F. Kennedy. So please stay tuned. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. We continue our special series on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This hour, Peter and I interview Mark Lane, attorney and leading researcher and author on the assassination of President Kennedy. From his 1966 best-selling critique of the Warren Commission, Rush to Judgment, and later work, Plausible Denial, to Last Word, My Indictment of the CIA in the Murder of JFK, Lane is noted as a key expert in matters regarding the JFK assassination and subsequent government cover-up. Please stay with us. I'm Eileen Alfandiri with news headlines. United Nations climate talks in Poland appeared headed into overtime with little hope of substantive agreement. Yeb Sanyo is the chief Philippines climate negotiator. He's been on a fast at the climate talks in the wake of deadly typhoon Haiyan. Others at the talks have joined his fast. Sanyo welcomed their support. I, of course, stand in solidarity with uh, the interfaith community as we... Uh, stand together on this urgent call for climate action, not just for climate action, but for uh, climate justice and uh, equity and solidarity uh, among uh, the most vulnerable peoples on earth. Negotiators in Poland are trying to lay the foundation for a 2015 deal that would take effect five years later. They've been stymied by fundamental disagreement over curbing greenhouse gas emissions and compensating poor countries for loss and damage caused by drought, flooding, and other extreme weather events caused by global warming. The death toll from Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines has risen above 5,000 and is likely to climb further. That's according to the Philippines Interior Secretary. He said more than 1,600 people still are missing. The government and the World Health Organization have launched a massive vaccination program for children to prevent outbreaks of measles and polio. Russian judges have granted bail for 29 of the 30 people arrested following an anti-oil drilling protest by Greenpeace in Arctic waters two months ago. Greenpeace posted bail for the 28 activists and two journalists. Reporters asked Peter Wilcox, the captain of the Arctic Sunrise, about whether their action was worth it. If we made people more aware of the dangers of drilling in the Arctic for oil and the unnecessary need for doing it, then it was successful. But at this point, for me, it's very hard to judge. The Greenpeace members and two journalists still face charges of hooliganism, which carry a sentence of up to seven years in prison. BART delayed the start of service until about 7.30 this morning, forcing commuters onto crowded roadways. The problem was caused when BART computers stopped properly communicating with track switches. BART's board yesterday voted to delete the paid family leave section of the recently concluded contract before ratifying it. BART management said it made a mistake when it signed off on the provision. Union leaders called the BART vote unprecedented and illegal, Josie Mooney was a chief negotiator for SEIU Local 10 to 1. This is stunning. In fact, we all are stunned. In my more than 25 years of experience negotiating contracts, I have never seen such abdication of responsibility. Union leaders said they would consult with an attorney and with union members before deciding on the next step. California's new health exchange covered California will not allow canceled policies to extend past the end of the year. The board voted unanimously against President Obama's proposal that people who have expiring individual insurance policies be allowed to renew them. Peter Lee, the executive director of Covered California, also said at last count nearly 80,000 Californians have signed up for coverage on the California exchange. What we have as of November 19th is 79,800 individuals, almost 80,000, who have gone end-to-end and picked a plan. 
They pick that plan six weeks before they need to. They don't need to pick till the end of the year, uh, which means that we have a huge uh, number of people that have said, you know, I see these private health plans available through Covered California, and I've been given the tools to pick the right plan for me. Last week, 18,000 in the week. Uh, we're seeing huge increase every week. Peter Lee is executive director of Covered California. A federal appeals court has refused to toss out court rulings finding that New York City carried out its stop and frisk policy in a racially discriminatory manner. Last month, an appeals panel had suspended the effects of a lower court ruling. New York City argued the panel's decision to remove federal judge Shira Shinlin meant it should also nullify her rulings. The court declined to do so. Dallas, Texas is observing the 50th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's assassination with its first official ceremony. Kennedy is being remembered with prayers, a speech by the mayor and military jets flying over the city plaza where he was shot. I'm Eileen Alfandari. News returns at 6 with the Pacifica Evening News. Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Peter and I have prepared a series of interviews about the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. In this hour, we speak with attorney, author, and JFK researcher Mark Lane, who has been questioning the official account of the assassination from the very beginning and has championed for the release of more government documents about the assassination and its aftermath. Mark Lane is also an author of three books on JFK, and here is our our interview with Mark Lane. Mark Lane's been a member of the bar for over half a century. He's the author of nine books, including New York Times best-selling Rush to Judgment and Plausible Denial. He was involved in a lawsuit against E. Howard Hunt and the CIA at a trial in the Miami District Court. He's a member of the New York State Legislature and is well known for his 50 years of research on the JFK assassination. Mark, welcome. Hi. Hi, how are you doing today? We're doing just fine. We want you to tell your story, 50 years now, how you got involved originally writing Rush to Judgment. And you were talking about the the Warren Commission problems early on. You were literally the first person really to get notoriety around this, and you took a lot of heat. So tell us what happened. Well, yeah, that was the first one. If you look at the New York Times, just a couple of days after the Warren Report came out, you'll see I am the only person they could find who said there were problems about this. Well, there might be problems about this. So that's on the front page of the New York Times. As the only person they could find, we had about 200 million people living in America then, and they couldn't find anybody else who thought there was a problem. I couldn't understand why everyone didn't think that this was a matter that had to be looked at very carefully. This was not a back alley killing of some unknown person. This was the President of the United States with the greatest protection one could imagine, uh, secret service all over the place providing protection and he was shot down in the middle of america on a bright sunny day with people watching it taking place and it just seemed to me that there were a lot of questions and uh, that, that they should be answered and uh J. Lee rankin who became counsel to the general counsel to the warren commission after we had made all of these complaints to the president of the united states lyndon johnson appoint a commission to look into what had taken place and it was heard by the then chief justice of the united states earl warren it was politically chosen two democrats two republicans one member of the senate one member of the house etc it was just a political operation and they said it was well balanced it wasn't well balanced but that's a side point it should not have been a political commission it should have been a commission made up of historians investigators people who knew what they were doing they had the chief justice as the chairman you know, he attended almost no hearings i i'm the only person in america who testified twice before the warren commission the major problem was that they never investigated the facts and they never intended to because j lee rankin the general counsel had said from the very beginning our job is to reassure the american people well, that should not have been their job. 
Their job should have been to get the facts and tell us the facts. And if the facts showed, as they would have, if they looked into them and reported them op properly, that shots came from at least two different directions at virtually the same time within 5.6 seconds. And therefore, unless these two guys happen to be uh, uh, unacquainted, there was a conspiracy to kill the president. And that was just the beginning of it. And I was astonished that nobody else saw this. I mean, a bullet hit the president in the back, it exited from the throat, a bullet hit him in the head from the front, drove him backward, brain and skull material came back to the far left, hit the left, and almost knocked a motorcycle officer who was on that motorbike to the left and rear, almost knocked him off with his bike. And the president was driven back, as you can see in the Zapruder film, the much more film, the next film all films were taken there. The Prude is not the only one. There are a lot of people there with cameras that day. And if you look at all, they all show the same thing. The president was hit from the right front. Then the, the first police officer on the scene went up that embankment toward that wooden fence on the grassy knoll, uh, fell off his, got, dropped his motorbike and ran back and found a man coming from behind the wooden fence. And he arrested him. He thought he had arrested the assassin, one of them. And he had, but the man flashed his credentials, which was Secret Service credentials, and therefore he was allowed to leave, never even asked his name. Incidentally, we have now discovered, of course, through frequent uh, motions that I made in the United States District Court actions to uh, declassify classified material. And the reason we won those actions is because I said to the United States District Court judge, for the District of Columbia, who was hearing the case, that the government says that one man did it, did it alone, it was Lee Harvey Oswald. Now they say there are reasons of national security why we cannot see all the evidence which they've classified and hidden from the American people. So I said, Your Honor, which, Your Honor, which one is this? Did one man do it alone, or is there a national security issue, meaning that more than one person was involved? At that point, he ordered that the documents be released, and two truckloads came to my townhouse in Washington, D.C., with tens and tens and tens of thousands of pages. And that's how we began to look into the evidence which the government did not want us to see. And one of the pieces of information that has come out was those Secret Service documents that were produced after the assassination by men, uh, by at least three men, one from the Glassy Knoll and two in back of the book depository, right. um, were, these were not Secret Service agents, yet they had full Secret Service documents. The Secret well, Service has said that they weren't there. So and we also know now at this point that the CIA did graphics for the documents for the Secret Service. Yes, this is interesting. It's an interesting point. We discovered that more recently, then you're quite right, that the CIA prepared the credentials for the news media that day, and everybody in the area, in the news media, uh, and those watching nearby who were part of the operation, they all had documents which said they were Secret Service, but they were prepared by the CIA. Now, the first question I have is, why couldn't the Secret Service... Remember, the Secret Service is a branch of the United States Treasury. Do they have a printing press? They print all of the money in America. It's maybe the largest printing organization in America, maybe in the world. That's the Treasury Department, which the Secret Service is a member of. So why do they have to ask the CIA to print their credentials and to distribute them? And it's important because... When they printed them, they knew who they were giving them to, and when they distributed them, they knew where each person who had a, a Secret Service credential was going to be because they, the CIA, had organized that. That's just one fact, one suspicious thing. But in your book, My Last Word, which uh, just recently came out, you're really describing kind of a summary of your 50 years of, of research and work and these are very important things. Now, you were also involved in a lawsuit where the CIA was suing a magazine in Florida for slander, or Howard Hunt was suing for slander, 
and you became their defense attorney. So what happened with that trial? I don't really recall. It was 50 years ago. I don't remember the details, but uh, but we prevailed. We always prevailed in all of these cases that we brought. As I said, I brought these actions under the Freedom of Information Act, and uh, the government was very reluctant to make stuff available. But finally, we got masses and masses of documents, and that, that's where we learned things that we had never known before. One of the most important things, I think, is, is how the, uh, the, the government decided to keep this secret. And this is crucial. And this is a, one of the documents that we got under the Freedom of Information Act. And what piqued my interest was that I, I lived in Washington, D.C., then right across the street from the Supreme Court, and a half a block away was the Veterans of Foreign Wars building, which is where Earl Warren and his commission held their hearing. So they were nearby, and I heard And when I knew they were coming out, we'd go over there with the press and listen to what they had to say. And the first question that was asked Earl Warren after the first hearing by a reporter is, when will we get the facts, Mr. Chief Justice, meaning the facts about who killed President Kennedy? And his answer was, you may never get the facts in your lifetime if all the information was known Hundreds of thousands of Americans might die. The press never picked that up as anything alarming. It was very alarming to me, but now we know what it was, what he was talking about. The CIA had briefed the Warren Commission, a man named David Atlee Phillips, who ran the CIA from his office in Mexico City. He ran the CIA for the Western Hemisphere, including, of course, the United States. They had told Earl Warren that Oswald was in Mexico City at the end of September and beginning of October 1963. He visited the Soviet embassy, and he visited the Cuban embassy. He was in Mexico City because he wanted to go from Mexico City after he came back to America and killed the president. This is the Warren Commission view. Uh, so he went from Mexico City, and his plan was to go back to Mexico City go to the Cuban embassy and get safe passage to the Soviet Union. That's why he visited the Cuban embassy and the Russian embassy. This was told to the Warren Commission, and the Warren Commission said, well, okay, we've looked into it. Russians and Cubans were not involved. But if these facts ever come out, if these facts come out, the American people will believe that the Russians and the Cubans were involved, and that will be World War III. That's where the hundreds of thousands of Americans are going to die. The only thing is Oswald was never even in Mexico City. And I can prove that nine different ways. I did in last word. But this is the most important part now, is that David Atlee Phillips, who ran the CIA in the Western Hemisphere from Mexico City and who invented the story that Oswald had been in Mexico City, years later spoke at a conference at the University of Southern California. And I was there. And I heard him speak, and he said, when all the facts come out, you will see that Oswald was never in Mexico City. So the guy that started the story, the one that terrorized the Warren Commission into classifying everything, covering everything up for fear that there'd be World War III, <laughs> was told by Phillips that Oswald was there, and now he's telling us the whole thing was made up. It was quite remarkable. And when this was reported in the news media, one of the apologists for the commission said, yes, it's true. Dave Phillips did say that Oswald was never in Mexico City, but that's after Mark Lane's brilliant, harassing cross-examination uh, had him so confused. That's what he said. Well, was that a... It was, at a, it was at a conference at the University of Southern California. It was tape recorded. It was in the news media. We have the transcripts and everything. I was there, but I didn't subject him to any cross-examination. And I was surprised when a student in the audience during the question period said, uh, Mr. Phillips, what can you tell us about Mexico City? And that's when he made the statement after founding around about family, well, well, this and that, and well, well, anyway, you'll see that Oswald was never there. So it wasn't my brilliant cross-examination. I was a witness to it, but I didn't even ask the question. It was asked by some student in the audience. And that's crucial, because if Oswald was not in Mexico City, and the CIA 
had already established that, that he was there. And who was Oswald in September 63? Nobody ever heard about him. But the CIA left a trail in Mexico City of someone who was supposed to be Oswald, but Oswald was not there, left a trail in September of 1963 so that two months later, when Oswald was arrested for the murder of the president, they could show the Mexico City connection. But the fact that Oswald was never there and the fact that the CIA had made up that story two months before the assassination tells us a great deal. It tells us that in September 1963, the CIA knew that two months later, the president was going to be assassinated in the United States. And how did they know that? They knew it because that's what they were planning to do, and that's what they did. And David Phillips even ran into a problem when he testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations in that they asked him for proof on the records that Oswell was in Mexico City, and he said they'd been destroyed, and the tapes had been destroyed, because they, they were taped to both embassies. Yet, however, their memo, after Phillips said that the tapes had been destroyed, a memo that was sent to the CIA to Hoover contradicted that, which yeah. well, there was a copy of. Yeah, it was after November 22nd, and it existed. And more than that, they had the tape recordings, and seven FBI agents, seven, that's everyone who had spoken to Oswald, he was arrested, of course, November 22nd, 63, and he was murdered in the basement of the Dallas Police and Courts Building two days later by Jack Ruby, who had been associated with American intelligence. But during those two days, he was questioned by seven FBI agents, nobody else. This is crucial. From the time Oswald was arrested to the time he was killed, he was not allowed to talk to an attorney. And he said, you can see him on the videotapes of him walking back and forth, being led by the police and the Secret Service and the CIA surrounding him. But he, would said, he said, will some lawyer please come forward and give me some advice? Will some lawyer please come forward? I haven't been allowed to see counsel. Okay, I'm a lawyer. That was an invitation. And I went to the Warren Commission. I went to the... Uh, the authorities in Dallas, and I said, I'd like to represent Mr. Oswald. He said, will a lawyer please come forward? I'm coming forward. But they wouldn't let me talk to him. They wouldn't let, not let anyone talk to Oswald except FBI agents, and we don't know what was said there, but they would not allow any ordinary civilian, lawyer or non-lawyer, to talk to Oswald. It was important that, that he be killed before he told anybody anything. Remember, I've been a defense lawyer for... 60 years now. And let me tell you, the most important piece of evidence, if you're a defense lawyer in a criminal case, is the defendant. He's your source. Now, he may lie to you, but even then, you have a chance to check it out. And very often, people say they're innocent when they're, in fact, guilty of something. And But if, for example, if I had seen Oswald, if any competent lawyer had seen Oswald. Daryl Posner, who wrote the establishment book, the most recent one, in support of the commission, said, if Mark Lane had represented Lee Harvey Oswald, Oswald would have been acquitted. And he's right. Any lawyer could have done that because what was absent in the charge against Oswald was any evidence that connected him to the assassination. No eyewitness. Nobody saw anything. Nobody did anything. And... Uh, to indicate that Oswald was involved. He never confessed. He kept on insisting he was innocent. The government would not allow him to talk to an attorney because, as I said, the first thing I would do, if you were my client, I would say, where were you? And he would tell me where he was at the time. And if it involved other people or other circumstances, I would go check them all out. doesn't mean the client is telling you the truth. The client often does not. But you can at least check out what he has to say and then if he's telling you something untrue and you know that, you go back and say, well, listen, I checked that out. That's not true. This witness said you weren't there. And then you have a chance to go on uh, with, with your inquiry and investigation. So the crucial piece of evidence, a lot of evidence was destroyed by the government. But the crucial piece of evidence that was destroyed was Lee Harvey Oswald, because that's where every defense lawyer begins, talks to his client, sees what that view is. And this is crucially important that Oswald was not allowed to talk to anyone in the 48 hours that he lived other than 
FBI agents who, of course, had a reason to not tell us what Oswald was saying. On occasion, he'd be leading through the news media, and he would say, well, some lawyer, please come forward and represent me. I'm innocent. I didn't do this. And he thought he'd been arrested for killing police officer Tippett, because that's what they told him. And it's right on the videotape. They said, did you kill the president? He said, what? The president? They haven't even talked to me about that. They said there's some police officer. So there he was in custody, questioned by the FBI. They weren't even asking about the Kennedy assassination. Didn't make any difference what he was going to say because no one would ever hear it. He was going to be dead within 48 hours. And he was shot to death in the Dallas police and courts building while being protected by the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, the Dallas police, the, the, the Deputy Sheriff's Association. They were all there. And one guy walked up to him and killed him. And yet America uh, was supposed to be convinced that he did it. He did it alone. And we can be reassured. And, and within two hours, uh, they were saying he was affiliated w with uh, pro-Castro activism and uh, were started to blame. And, th and that information came out of the Miami um, CIA station under, under Phillips. Well, of course, Phillips made it all up. And, you know, he has since basically said that. As I said, he spoke at USC, and, people, and uh, when he made these con this confession, basically, that he had made up this story about Oswald's background, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, apologists for the commission said, well, yeah, because Mark Lane subjected him to gross examination. I didn't even ask him a question. It was a student in the audience who merely said, tell us about Mexico City. And that's when he told the story. And, of course... Cross-examination is something that takes place in a courtroom. The witness is under oath. So that can't be cross-examination in a public meeting uh, because all Phillips could, would have to say if he wanted to say anything and not answer the question is, is that's sort of classified, I can't go into it. He had said that a number of occasions about a number of different things. So there was no question of cross-examination. There was no compulsion. And it was not even me who asked the question. But for some reason... After all those years, he decided the burden was too heavy and he was going to tell the truth. And later that day, because that was a panel that had a number of CIA people, a number of uh, other intelligence people, and a number of people who uh, opposed their, what they were doing, including myself, Donald Freed and others. Donald Freed was a teacher out there, a playwright, who had organized that whole conference at USC. And uh, we, nobody could compel him to do anything, Phillips or anybody else. And uh, all you have to say is, that's not relevant, so I'd rather not discuss that, or it's classified. After all, I was working in my capacity for the Central Intelligence Agency then. He didn't do those things. He answered the questions. There was no compulsion, and he made it plain. Oswald was never in Mexico City. So if Oswald was not in Mexico City in September, why did the CIA leave a trail behind saying that he was there in September, knowing that... They wanted to have him as the fall guy in the Kennedy assassination. And, but the frightening thing, of course, is the, is the assassination had not taken place. So they had pre-knowledge of that assassination, uh, which is frightening because there's only one way they could have that, and we know what it is. We're talking to Mark Lane, longtime researcher on the JFK assassination, author of Rush to Judgment, author of Plausible Denial and more recently, a book, My Last Word. You've been very involved in this, but during the course of, the, of your involvement, you now have evidence where the CIA was actually identifying you and calling on their assets uh, in the media to, to um, label you a communist and, and uh, try to discredit you. How did you come about that information? Good old Freedom of Information Act. And uh, I brought an action in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Again, the government said it was a question of national security. And again, I said to the judge, they say one man did it and did it alone. There was no conspiracy. They cannot tell us there are questions of national security involved and stick to that story. So which one is it, Your Honor? And he said, which one? And they didn't have an answer. And so they released. He ordered this evidence to be released. And it, yes, it's a, it's a kind of a chilling doctrine. It tells, it's a CIA document talking about how to silence me. And, uh, and, to, and it was sent not only to, uh, all of the stations in, in the United States and all of their contacts in the United States and their assets in the United States. The assets were 
people who worked up the New York Times, CBS, their assets, that they considered to be assets were in all of the news media in America. But it was sent because I was also lecturing on occasion in uh, London and in Oxford and places like that. So it was sent to all of the station chiefs all over the world and to all of the embassies of the United States all over the world. To, uh, and, and the embassy took action, for example. I was, uh, and they were told how to do it. For example, if it was announced that I was going to speak in Paris, uh, then they would have someone claiming to be with the American embassy in Paris uh, send out a, a document saying that the, the place where I was going to speak had been changed, or the day had been changed, or the time had been changed. In other words, they sent out this information so that people would not come. Nevertheless, there were large numbers of people found their way there, and we were able to get uh, people all around the world involved in this, and that's how uh, well, we formed a Citizens Commission requiring in the United States with a number of really important leading people participating, Linus Pauling and many others. Uh, uh, they were formed all over, all over Europe as well, with members of parliament and, and uh, leaders of government even uh, demanding that the information be made available to everyone. So it was a, an interesting run. And, uh, of course, one of the documents I used when organizing this was the CIA document saying that I had to be silenced. And I said, don't join in that. Uh, and then, of course, we heard from J. Lee Rankin, who was a counsel of the commission, and he kept on saying, we have to reassure, we have to reassure the American people. How? By telling us that there was a conspiracy to kill the president? We didn't catch the guys that are still out there running around? Uh, do you feel reassured now? That wouldn't do it. How do you reassure the American people? One man did it. He did it alone. He's dead. And it's all over. That's how they could reassure the American people. And anyone who says to the contrary is called a conspiracy theorist or a communist at that time. Yeah, sometimes both. The thing is that uh, this is not a theory. Shots came from two directions at the same time. That is within 5.6 seconds. At least two different directions at the same time. It's not a theory. Uh, you're just indicating that you believe that these two people were acquainted with each other when they both decided to kill the president. And, uh, and that is proof of a conspiracy. But, you know, they call me, I mean, the government would refer to me as a conspiracy theorist. While we are talking now, in every city, uh, in every state, there are grand juries who are being presented with evidence by federal authorities or state authorities claiming that some person somewhere was guilty of a conspiracy. This is the major tool used by federal and state courts to prosecute people for crimes which they committed, or sometimes too often for crimes which they did not commit. They throw the conspiracy count in there. The federal government and every state government and all the prosecutors, they are the conspiracy theorists. They do this thousands of times a day all together throughout the country. And I said when shots came from two directions at the same time, obviously it was a conspiracy. I did it one time because the evidence called for it. That doesn't make me a conspiracy theorist. We're speaking with Mark Lane, author most recently of Last Word, My Indictment of the CIA in the Murder of JFK. Mark Lane, this is Mickey Huff from Project Censored. Thanks again for joining us for the interview. Well, thank you. You have a chapter in your book, Last Word, called The CIA and the Media, and you just touched on that. Peter just mentioned the, the term conspiracy theorist and how the CIA hatched that term to discredit J. Edward Epstein and others and, and uh, a long history of uh, Operation Mockingbird and CIA folks working inside newsrooms to spread propaganda of official narratives. Uh, there's an incident that comes up closer to the present here that involves the Nation magazine and Max Holland that were really doing uh, hit pieces essentially on you. Could, could you tell the story about about what happened with that, about Max Holland and about about the Nation magazine? Yeah, Nation published an article uh, by Holland. It was not just an attack on me. It was a good lawyer's conspiracy or something like that. It was an attack upon any any lawyer who raised any questions about the Kennedy assassination. And it was written by Max Holland. He was referred to as a Nation writer. But if you check him out on the Internet, which I did, to check out Max Holland, CIA, and you see who he wrote for. It was right after. I'm not sure it's on anymore. 
but I did it at the time, and I wrote a piece about it, and the nation published it. I wrote my long letter to the editor denouncing what they had done. It said, who is Max Holland? Are you interested in knowing how his association with the CIA? Go CIA.gov Max Holland. And you'll see his, he's worked so closely with them that he's on their, he's a person they refer to as their authority on these matters. So that's what wrote the piece. So it wasn't surprising. I know what the CIA wants to do. The CIA wanted to not let us know the facts. And uh, it's interesting to know what the, how the CIA was set up. It was set up by President Harry Truman. Uh, he, he set up this group. Uh, and he and he and he wrote about it, and he and he said that he had set this up in order to. He said it was not going to be operational, it was not going to be policy making, it was a group because he was getting intelligence information from the, we had the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and every one of these organizations have their own intelligence group, and he was just getting overwhelmed with all these different kinds of statements. So he set the CIA up as an organization merely to look over the intelligence of all the other organizations, synthesize it, and present it to the president. And that's what Harry Truman said. And it's interesting that one month to the day after the assassination, when the question was, well, what was, this, was the CIA involved, Truman wrote a piece published in the Washington Post. Could have been the New York Times, but he wanted to be in Washington where every member of Congress would see it, in which he said why he set up the CIA and that it was not supposed to be operational, not supposed to be policy making, but merely a group which gathered some information from the other intelligence agencies and gave it to him. And he felt betrayed that they had done, they'd become operational. So what was he telling us one month after the assassination <laughs> to the day? in the Washington Post. He was telling us that the CIA was involved in some horrific policy-making operation, which was the assassination of President Kennedy. Another person actually thought about this long before I did, when Robert Kennedy, then the Attorney General, was told that his brother had been killed. His first question was, was it the CIA? That was long before I became involved in any of this. So how you have the former president, former president Harry Truman, who knew these guys because he'd set up the agency, but he knew what they were doing. And then you have the attorney general of the United States, his brother just been killed, both raising the question of the involvement of the CIA. And that was long, long before I became involved in this investigation. The reason I became involved in it, I should say, is that uh, in... 1960, I ran for membership in the uh, New York State Legislature from a district which was Yorkville and East Harlem. York was Irish, Jewish, German, etc. And the other part of the district was Hispanic, mostly Puerto Ricans and, and African Americans. And I said, I'm running now because this is in the hands of organized crime, and it was, and it's been there for years. I'm going to run. If I'm elected, I will not run for re-election. I'll ask the community to pick someone and I will support him. I was I served my two years in state legislature. I did a number of things there. And uh, first person in America to call the fallout shelter program a hoax and to lead demonstrations of thousands of people against it. And uh, John Kennedy, based upon that, said he was not going to go along with this national fallout shelter hoax. In any event, that was back in the state legislature. And uh, I, I uh, got to know John Kennedy during that campaign, I worked very closely with his brother Bobby in that campaign. John, I met a few times, but Bobby was one I worked with. So I had a personal interest in this, the same interest that everybody in America had about our president, our president being assassinated. Because do we live in a democracy where we struggle and fight for every vote and then find that a couple of guys with rifles can cancel the election? If that's so, that's, if that's allowed and there's no response adequate response by the government, we have to wonder where we're living and if we can call ourselves a democracy if our votes really count. Or and, and you bring up, uh, you brought up uh, Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy at this point. So I want to ask you, you, you describe how the fact that, that Robert Kennedy really didn't say a lot publicly 
about his brother, and that was used to defend the Warren Commission report for a long time. But in 1968, he did meet with Jim Garrison, and Garrison told you this story where Robert Kennedy said to Garrison, keep up the good work. I support you, and when I'm president, I'm going to blow the whole thing open. Now, he was saying this to other people as well at the same time, so... He said it to me. He said it to you. Well, I called him and uh, told him, said, I want to talk to you about some things, and he said, all right, Mark, I knew him, as I said, I worked closely in the campaign. This is after the assassination uh, that I was, this conversation took place. And I said, uh, I'd like to talk with you. Uh, you're free for lunch, and we made a date for lunch. He said, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. If you want to talk about that, I'm not going to talk about that. And I know what that was. He was so damaged by the loss of his brother. Nobody who didn't know him, if you didn't know him, you would have no idea. Of the damage. I think he went to Indonesia or someplace and took off for, for some time. It just almost destroyed him. And uh, But when he came back, we talked, and basically he said this thing, thing to me and said to other people, and that is that if, he knew he couldn't do anything uh, unless he had power. He was running to be president, and the first item on the agenda was to destroy the Central Intelligence Agency and set up a new intelligence organization which would be responsive to the president and not act on its own and not be involved in this kind of operation activity. And the second thing was to find out all the details about the death of his brother. But, of course, then he was killed, and he never was able to do either of those things. Mark Lane, I wanted to get back to the original question that I asked about the CIA and the media, and I was curious, just for as a follow-up question, you wrote the editor at The Nation, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, quite extensively about Max Holland and the CIA connections and sort of the smear that was happening across the spectrum. What was the reply? I mean, what, what did you hear back from these folks regarding your letter? Nothing, but they published my letter. They did publish your letter, but they, but they said nothing to you directly. No, that was it. They wrote, they published the letter, but uh, the, the fact is that I just said, you know, this guy's being cited everywhere as a nation correspondent. Aren't you embarrassed? He's a CIA guy. He, he is a correspondent from the Central Intelligence Agency, and they have sheep dipped him by dropping him in through Nation magazine. Are you going to allow them to keep on referring to him as a Nation magazine reporter when he is CIA? And uh, I had not, I don't believe I've seen since that. They never answered me directly. They published my letter, and as you said, as we agreed, but they never answered me specifically. But I don't believe. He was ever again, I'm not sure of this, but I followed it for a while. It was 50 years ago or so, and I don't check the papers every day about Max Holland. But I don't think he's been referred to as a nation uh, writer uh, since that time. Mark, what, what do you make of the con conflicting information about the rifle? Originally, the Dallas police said it was a 7.65 German Mauser. A German mouse, yeah. And then, and then it turns out that uh, Oswald didn't have one of those, so that though it became an Italian, the the, the Italian Car Carcano. Magnus a Carcano caliber six point five. Okay. There were two rifles, or what? What, ha what happened there? Yeah. Well, uh, I testified before the Warren Commission. They asked me to come. They don't want to hear any information from me. They just want to say that I was that I had talked to them. And so they, so they called me before them and let me say whatever I wanted to say. And they basically didn't have any questions. They just uh, wanted to be able to say, well, we listened to all sides. Um, and they were, I'll tell you, all seven of them, seven members, I were present when they questioned Jacqueline Kennedy. And I'm not sure they were present when they questioned anybody else. It's often not even a member of the commission, sometimes just lawyers for the commission. But they were all there when I was there. And they listened to me. They didn't ask, ask any questions, really. They just wanted me. To, they wanted to be able to say that, yeah, I, I had testified before them, and and I did. But uh, uh, so they could say that, and they published my testimony, and then they reached their conclusions. 
which had no reality. As I said, a lot of the conclusions have to do with Oswald in, in, uh, in Mexico City. And that Mexico City story was crucial because it was then that they were able to say that Oswald had met with the Russians and the Cubans at their embassies, but we don't believe there was a conspiracy that the Russians and Cubans were involved, but the American people will believe it. And as I said, that's why Warren came out from his first hearing and said, uh, you'll never get the truth in our lifetime. And uh, if the facts ever came out, hundreds of thousands of people could die. He's talking about World War III, because we, if we heard that Oswald was there, we would all say, yeah, let's declare war. Well, of course, we wouldn't do that, but that was something they were... They said they were concerned about. But, of course, when you come right down to it, Oswald was never in Mexico City. The story was fabricated by David Atlee Phillips, who ran the CIA for the United States from his office in Mexico City. Mexico City is a good place for the CIA director of America to be because they don't have a lot of reporters who are asking a lot of questions, and uh, they don't have police who are wondering about illegal activity taking place there. Uh, and because they were foreigners, and they didn't care what they did in the United States. They couldn't, Phillips could not operate out of the United States. Uh, he's committed too many crimes, uh, including mail fraud and stuff like that, federal crimes. And so, uh, but it's interesting that Phillips finally, at the very end, undercut the entire fabric of the Warren Commission's foundation by saying that Oswald was never in Mexico City, and he's the one who had been the source for saying that Oswald was there. Which comes, I say, to a terrifying question. How did they set up, uh, if Oswald was never in Mexico City, but the CIA set up a trail saying that he was there in September so they could link him to a crime which hadn't taken place yet. How did they know in September that two months later the president would be killed in America? And the only answer can be is their involvement. Well, and Oswald's history, of course, uh, joining the Marines at 17, um, finishing basic, and then, and then studying Russian at the Monterey Language Institute, um, so that he really became fluent in Russian. He certainly didn't learn that growing up. Well, he lived in the Soviet Union. Probably. And, and then moving to the Soviet Union to de facto and then coming back, fully assisted by the U.S. government, coming back. And his wife, too, was not a citizen. Exactly. So it's pretty clear that there was some uh, intelligence work going on with Oswell all along. Yeah, obviously they had picked Oswell out. I'm sure, they had, I'm sure Oswell was not the only one in the files who they could blame the assassination on. I mean, what if he got hit by a truck in Moscow? What would happen to the story? I'm sure there were several people around various places ready to be utilized and set up if it wasn't, if Oswald, everything happened to Oswald. Could, could, was one of these people Gilbert Lopez, who was involved in the Tampa November 18th plan to assassinate Kennedy? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I've been reading about that, and there were two other assassination attempts uh, or plans, uh, November 2nd in Chicago, Right. Four, a four-man hit team, two were Cuban exiles uh, with a fall guy named Thomas Allen Ballet, troubled ex-Marine, and, and then in Tampa, November 18th. All of that, of course, is laid out in a number of books. Yeah, well, the CIA doesn't have one plan. If uh, They have to have backups because if they're on a mission, they want to make sure that they accomplish it, and they finally did on November 22nd. And we lost our beloved president. And it is, it's still in my heart. I mean, I know John, uh, and as I said, I work with him very closely with Bobby in the campaign. But, uh, uh, you know, his policies during the three years he was in office were not all that different. But the feeling in America was, was after the Ike age of the silence and f frozen ideas, all of a sudden the lights were brilliant night in the White House. There was a whole spirit in America. We had a young president, uh, attractive young wife, beautiful kids. I mean, it, it was like America had changed overnight. We were a country which now had some hope about what the future might bring, and then that ended on November 22, 1963. And uh, here we are 50 years later still talking about it, 
and because we never got over it. And uh, the most amazing thing is with all of the media in America, all of it, supporting the story that Oswald did it alone, with the government supporting that, uh, and with me and a few other people saying, I'm not so sure, almost two-thirds of the American people said they did not believe the story that Oswald was a lone assassin. shows that the American people have a lot more sense than the leadership gives them credit for. Uh, Mark Lane, your book titled Last Word, let's bring this up to the present. Here we are 50 years later. Uh, what do you still have hope for? What I've hoped for all of these years and worked for all of these years, this is not the only thing I've done for the last 50 years, but this has been a, a theme for a lot of my work, is to have this country become an honorable country again. And our honor can be restored only when the government that we elect tells us the truth about what they did 50 years ago. And when that day ha comes, if it should come, but when it comes, if it does come, we will then be able to say, hold our heads up in the world and say we are an honorable country. Until then, I don't think we have that right. Mark Lane, we really thank you for taking the time to uh, update us on your work and um, the honoring the 50th anniversary of the death of uh, the assassination uh, thank you very of John much. Kennedy. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Mark Lane, who had been a member of the bar for half a century, is author of nine books, including the New York Times best-selling Rush to Judgment and Plausible Denial. He defeated E. Howard Hunt and the CIA in a trial in the U.S. District Court and was a member of the New York State Legislature. He is the best-known researcher of the JFK assassinations. His last book, Last Word, My Indictment of the CIA in the Murder of JFK. Nikki, you know, when we look at this, and, and um, I've probably been preparing for these interviews for six months, read a number of books over the summer, we keep running into these contradictions that just uh, that make it really difficult to accept uh, alone uh, Oswald doing this alone. I mean... Uh, Aquila Clements uh, was an eyewitness to the Tippett shooting, never called before the Warren Commission, testified that two men assassinated Tippett, and the story is, of course, that Tippett had picked up Oswald and uh, was driving him, and Oswald escaped, uh, escaped what was then an assassination plot to kill them both. That kind of information. Then, the, of course, Bobby Hargis, who was the officer that Mark Lane was talking about at the left rear of of the uh, presidential limousine, who, when he sees Kennedy's head literally explode, he splattered with blood and body parts that came from the front, a frontal shot, and his testimony was left out of the uh, out of the Warren Commission report. So you, ha and then we have the Secret Service agents who were unaccountable for where they came from, a variety of things just on that day, let alone the circumstances historically of trying to claim. Oswald was in Mexico City when, in fact, he wasn't now. It's quite clear. Um, and then deathbed confessions from Phillips and from Hunt saying that they were there and involved in that. And all of that, of course, is circumstantial. But it's quite an amazing story when we look at it, let alone the fact that other assassination plots have been occurring both in Tampa November 18th and Chicago on November 2nd that were uncovered by the police there and Secret Service, and, and uh, intercepted. Yet Kennedy was still allowed to, to go down to Dallas and be in an open car. That's right, Peter. And I, I wanted to conclude here by actually reading briefly the postscript from Mark Lane's book, Last Word, where he says, quote, There is more than sufficient evidence for the Attorney General of the United States and for United States attorneys serving in various jurisdictions to impanel a grand jury and consider asking for an indictment of the CIA and its leaders. The failure of nerve and the lack of devotion to principle are all that prevents those sworn officers of the court from acting in accordance with the law and their obligations. If all that is now required is an accusation, 
I accuse. That's how Mark Lane ends his book. And certainly we're still waiting 50 years later for the truth to finally come out about who killed JFK. It's also the case that um, the official narrative from the Warren Commission report has been so uh, seared into the minds of Americans, uh, despite the fact that over two thirds of people don't don't buy it. But it still continues. And the network shows and so forth that are now on the 50th anniversary of JFK, they're really pushing those. And then they offer often more outlandish or groundless or factless theories to try to straw person style, make it look that anybody that questions the official narrative is making lunatic claims and so on. And I, I can't help again but go back to Edward J. Epstein, the CIA mockingbird program smearing him as a conspiracy theorist. We just heard with Mark Lane again. Uh, not only were they the CIA trying to discredit him, but they were doing it decades later. The same, again, tired narratives trying to discredit him. And even into the so-called liberal media media, you know, not the corporate media, but the liberal progressive foundation funded media, the narratives there of attacking anybody that questions it. And I have to say that we've interviewed several people here, but Mark Lane clearly has has something to say about this and is clearly an expert on the matter. And again, anybody that's bothered to do any of the research and look into any of the things that that you've just been rattling off here, um, there were plenty of people that were angry at Kennedy. There were plenty of groups and organizations that wanted to continue uh, American empire in ways that perhaps Kennedy questioned. And, um, you know, the, the question may, may not be who, who shot Kennedy, but who, who didn't want to. It seemed like he had a lot of enemies. And, uh, again, the Warren Commission report kind of came in and played cleanup. Well, that, that feeds right into Peter Dale Scott's uh, hypotheses of deep events and uh, his understanding of, of uh, deep politics. And he's a dynamic scholar. I have to say that first off, and and I would put Jefferson Morley in that category as well, a dynamic journalist who want to stick with what we know, not do speculation on on theories. And it's offensive when you see articles written most recently uh, last week uh, was a story out saying, oh, there's 350 conspiracy theories about JFK as if they were all lunatic. And Morley's quite clear with that, saying that, yeah, there's some are that are pretty, pretty awful. And he certainly said the mistaken gunfiring by the Secret Service and the limousine behind blowing Kennedy's head off is an absurd story. But, but yet that's playing on national television, on reels, as we talk. So the confusion that, that's deliberate out there, the labeling of people as conspiracy theorists, and that are, of course, we look, we accept Mark Lane for, for the research and the 50 years that he's done, but we've also taken a hard look at, at, at really hard, good, solid scholars who, who examine this work in, in, a, in a realistic way, and certainly Peter Dale Scott and Jefferson Morley are, are, are exactly that. That's an important piece of everything, and, and I would have to say, that uh, Oliver Stone and the movie JFK have, are pretty correct on, on what they've got. And it's a very important film that laid out and brought about the Congressional JFK Archives Records Act back in 92, which released a lot more archives, and, and from those we've learned more. And we've seen the pattern, too. Uh, Oliver Stone was viciously attacked when the film came out. 20 years later, uh, over 20 years later, the Blu-ray release is is now out. And a lot of, again, what Stone had, had uh, argued in the film has since been shown to be correct by some of the records released in the archives. Of course, uh, Jefferson Morley at JFK Facts still trying to get more of the material available. And again, one of the, uh, to, again, to underscore that point, we're looking for transparency here. We're looking to actually see the evidence the documentation to to really be uh, put this uh, behind us in in ways, but also to remind us in the present that transparency is really the only way we can be effectively self governing uh, as a people. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips of Project Censored. We'd like to make a special thanks to Anthony Fest for helping put together all these broadcasts, and thank you for joining us. Taken, La Peña Cultural Center and the Freeland Project present for the sixth year, Thangs Taken, Rethinking Thanksgiving, an event to challenge our society's celebration of a colonial mythology through story, song, and speech, to recognize the history of the land we live on and to honor indigenous people's resistance. 
This is a benefit for the Olone Land Trust. Thanks taken will be on November 24th at 7 p.m. at La Peña Cultural Center, 3105 Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley near Ashby Bart, and will feature Corina Gold, Ariel Lucky, We 